Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, the Monday show in which I give you a rundown of the past seven days of Starship development, launch news from around the world, and all the other space stories that took place that I think are interesting. Lots to discuss again this week from Starship, a very interesting Falcon 9 launch, a Dragon launch that wasn't from SpaceX, a couple of other major rocket flights from across the globe, and much, much more. This episode was sponsored by Squarespace, the internet's number one spot for building a website. More on that later, but first, let's kick off the video with Starship news. Ship 24 has been swarmed by scaffolding for a few weeks now, after it was clear that some structural reinforcement of its welds would be necessary before the first orbital flight test. Uh, we saw several heat shield tiles removed to allow welding teams to access the areas needing reinforcement. But now, it looks like the work is done, and the scaffolding is starting to come down, and almost all of the heat shield tiles have been reinstalled. I would assume that Ship 25 has undergone a similar strengthening procedure in the high bay, though of course, since it's fairly well occluded, it's more difficult to say for sure with this one. Speaking of Ship 25 though, Starship Gazer caught this shot of it in the high bay with a rather suspicious work platform at the level of the Starlink Pez dispenser door. It's likely that SpaceX are going to cover up the door with a welded on metal plate, much like what they did with Ship 24. I wonder why. Could it be that Starlink V2 just isn't ready yet? I'd say this would be an unlikely reason. At the end of the day, a boilerplate satellite would be fine for an initial test flight, since, if anything, you'd want to use a dummy payload to test the dispenser mechanism for the first time. I think it's probably more likely that either the dispenser mechanism itself or the payload bay door hasn't been deemed flight ready. And so for now, SpaceX are just focusing on getting the vehicle itself to work. Or maybe they're abandoning the Pez dispenser concept completely and instead are going for a more traditional style payload bay door, like this concept from Eric and Small Stars from a couple of years ago. What do you think? Let me know what your theories are in the comment section below. And hey, while you're down there, be sure to leave a like on the video to help support what I do here, and be sure to subscribe as well so that you never miss a Monday Space News update. Do you guys remember that 14-engine Raptor 2 static fire test that took place about a month ago? You'll probably recall that in the aftermath of that test, much of the concrete base of the launch pad needed to be ripped up and replaced with a much stronger compound that could better withstand the massive forces subjected to it by those Raptor 2 engines. And now, we're starting to get clues about how well this new concrete holds up, as following the 11-engine long-duration static fire test that we saw around two weeks ago, apparently it's still not enough. Starship Gazer caught this footage of crews needing to once again tear up and replace the concrete under the launch pad. We can also see lots of work on the plumbing systems for the launch table as well, with a significant amount of piping being removed. Luckily, the piping appears to have now been reinstalled. Lab Padre's stream captured workers reinstalling this piece here. But this seems to be an ongoing problem with the launch pad, and it's a problem that SpaceX are going to need to resolve if they want to achieve their lofty ambition of being able to launch multiple Starships per day. There is some irony to all of this. <coughs> While Starship may be the first ever fully reusable launch vehicle, its launch pad seems to be expendable. <laughs> I covered in fairly extensive detail last week about why a flame trench isn't possible at Starbase, the short answer is that digging below ground level would be below the water table and therefore isn't really feasible, but a lot of people are now questioning if a flame diverter could be an option, as this will direct the main force of the blast outwards away from the concrete directly below the pad. An example of one can be seen here, this is the Kennedy Space Center's launch pad 39B, and this big sloped structure is the diverter. The rocket kind of sits directly on top of where this is. <laughs> maybe this will eventually be adopted by Starship, or maybe SpaceX will finally figure this out and continue without one. We'll just have to see. Also visible in Starship Gazer's photos is this new berm extension. This berm is designed to shield the orbital tank farm from the exhaust of the rocket, and apparently it needs to be slightly taller, so SpaceX are adding this yellow extension to the top. Speaking of shielding, we continue to see lots of cladding being added to the orbital launch tower. That's this black shielding there. That will eventually extend all the way to the top of the tower to ensure that its guts are protected from the heat and forces of the orbital launch. Rocket science, eh? Who'd have thought it'd be so hard? Certainly much harder than building a website with Squarespace! That's about as easy as things can be, and Squarespace have sponsored today's episode of Space This Week. Squarespace is the place to go when you need a website. You can build any website with ease. 
Whether you're a photographer setting up an online portfolio, an up-and-coming podcast looking to elevate your brand to the next level, or starting up a whiskey review blog, Squarespace has you covered. With a massive range of professionally designed industry standard templates, which you can use as a starting point to create a website truly tailored to your needs. And unlike Starship, it's not rocket science. Don't feel restricted by the template, you can change anything and everything about it, from adding new layers, text boxes, links and more. There's even a fantastic selection of stock images included in Squarespace's editor, so you can find the perfect images or background art for your website. And once your website is finished and ready for launch, you can save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain by heading over to squarespace.com slash Go on, build the website of your dreams today. It's been just over a week now since Booster 7 was lifted off the orbital launch mount and placed onto a transporter stand, after which it was then shipped off back down to the build site area and placed inside the Mega Bay, where it will undergo final preparations for the very first Starship orbital test flight. It's been a long time coming now, so hopefully this is definitely Booster 7's final stay at the build site. We've been following the construction of the new tent at Starbase, which is currently sitting behind the high and mega bays, and we've been kind of speculating about what this tent is going to be used for. Well, now we know what it's not going to be used for. Starship Gazer caught these photos of the end framing being placed at either end of the tent, and as you can see, there's no space to accommodate the big, large garage doors that the other tents have. So there's no way that this tent is going to be used to store wide barrel segments of Starship and super heavy vehicles. So whatever this tent will be used for, it'll be used for storing smaller objects. Think like Raptor 2 engines. Its official designation is the Sanchez Inventory Tent. SpaceX pulled off a big mission last week, yesterday on the 11th of December, after a nearly two week delay, a Falcon 9 blasted off the pad from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral, carrying two satellites, the Hakuto RM1 and the Lunar Flashlight. I'm sure you've heard about this mission by now, since it's a very exciting one. This is a lunar landing mission. The Hakuto RM1 was built by private Japanese firm iSpace, and it was placed on a ballistic lunar transfer by the Falcon 9 rocket. It'll spend the next few months traveling to the moon, and upon arrival, it'll place itself into a lunar orbit before beginning its landing sequence, which will see it descend down to the surface over the course of about an hour before hopefully successfully touching down. It's carrying the Rashid rover, built by the United Arab Emirates, as well as numerous scientific payloads. This mission is an important first step for iSpace in establishing their lunar landing capabilities, and their long-term ambition is to expand human activity on the moon with thousands of people visiting, living, and working on the moon. The secondary payload on this launch was the aforementioned NASA Lunar Flashlight Satellite. This is also heading to the moon, but it's only an orbiting satellite, it's not a lander. It's about the size of a briefcase and it'll orbit the moon and will use near-infrared lasers and an onboard spectrometer to map out the ice in the permanently shadowed regions near the moon's south pole, which in turn could provide information about the presence of water ice deposits inside the craters that would be a valuable resource for any future Artemis missions to the lunar surface. After the second stage of the Falcon 9 separated, the first stage performed an extra long boost back burn that enabled it to land at the landing site at Cape Canaveral, rather than needing to land on a barge. It was great to see the night sky once again lit up by the Merlin engine exhaust. This was the fifth launch and landing for this particular Falcon 9 first stage booster, which previously launched the SES-22 and three Starlink missions. China made some pretty big achievements last week. On Wednesday, the China Aerospace and Industry Corporation oversaw the return to flight mission of its Kwaizu 11 launch vehicle. The Kwaizu 11 had its maiden flight in July 2020, and while everything seemed to start off okay, the rocket failed to reach its intended orbit. Not much information was publicly released about the failure because, you know, China, but it was probably pretty bad as the rocket was declared retired in April this year. However, the old girl has made a comeback from the dead with its return to flight last Wednesday. This time, the mission was a success and the rocket single payload, a technology demonstration satellite, successfully ended its planned orbit. State media reports that this satellite will be mainly used for communications tests and key technology verification of very high frequency data exchange systems. The next day, on Thursday, another Chinese rocket launch took place, this time a Long March 2D, which launched from the Taiwan Satellite Launch Center, carrying a single Geofen 501A satellite. 
State media states that this satellite has now ended its planned orbit and is a hyperspectral satellite that will be used for remote sensing and applications in diverse fields such as pollution reduction, environmental monitoring, natural resource surveys and climate change studies. The third and final launch from China last week was a pretty exciting one. This was the maiden flight of the Smart Dragon 3 rocket. Remember how earlier I said there was a Dragon launch that wasn't SpaceX? This was that tenuous, uh, whatever. Uh, it launched from the Taihu Sea-based platform in the Yellow Sea on the 9th of December, and this new solid propellant rocket was carrying 14 satellites to low Earth orbit, of which five are for Earth observation, one for the Internet of Things, one for education, and one for astrobiology research. Always fun to see new rockets take to the skies, especially ocean-launched ones. On the 5th of December, NASA's Artemis 1 mission came one step closer to Earth. The Orion spacecraft made its return powered flyby of the moon, performing a burn behind the moon that placed it on a trajectory back towards Earth. Since the burn took place behind the moon, Mission Control had no direct signal to the spacecraft, so fingers were crossed at Mission Control during the expected burn window. The burn couldn't be confirmed successful until the spacecraft reappeared from behind the moon, and luckily everything went to plan. Here you can see this shot of the spacecraft emerging. We can see Orion, the Moon, Earth, and Mars. Okay, I was just kidding about that last one. That's the Sun's ghost image on the camera. <laughs> of course, this isn't the only major step in the Artemis 1 mission that happened last week, but we'll talk about the other thing that happened a little bit later on. First though, I want to discuss another Falcon 9 launch that we saw last week. On the 8th of December, SpaceX launched the newest batch of OneWeb satellites. OneWeb used to be launched via the Soyuz launch system, but following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, a new launch provider would be required. We've since seen a OneWeb launch supported by New Space India with the launch vehicle Mark III, and now last week we saw SpaceX lend a hand, which is definitely interesting since the OneWeb satellite network effectively competes with SpaceX's Starlink, though Starlink is currently much more massive in scope and size. The two networks also have slightly different intended markets. OneWeb is aimed primarily towards businesses, governments, including defense, phone network operators and clusters of communities rather than to individual domestic customers, which is the demographic that Starlink primarily targets. Following stage separation, Falcon 9's first stage, B-1069, performed a boost back burn back to landing zone 1 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, having previously supported three missions, CRS-24, Utilsat Hot Bird 13F and one Starlink mission. Our man Tim Dodd, better known as the everyday astronaut, is going to the moon. You guys probably know this by now, but yes, Tim Dodd has been confirmed to be one of the crew members of Dear Moon, a trip around the moon on board Starship, hosted by Yusaka Miyazawa. I'm super happy for Tim, definitely a very deserving winner, and if he launches from Boca Chica, then I can assure you all that I will definitely be there as well, in the high bay bar, filming the launch in one hand and raising a champagne glass in the other. On Sunday, we saw the epic conclusion of the Artemis 1 test flight, the splashdown of Orion. The capsule has had one heck of a journey, launching on the world's most powerful operational rocket, flying further from Earth than any spacecraft made for humans has ever flown, and then, after 25 days in space and having covered some 1.4 million miles, the spacecraft re-entered the atmosphere, coming in hotter and faster than any built-for-human spacecraft has ever flown before. After the lethal re-entry phase was over, the capsule enjoyed a gentle descent under parachute before splashing down in the Pacific Ocean just off the coast of California. Congratulations to all who worked on Artemis 1. This was a spectacular end to a truly epic mission. I can't wait for Artemis 2, where we'll see the first NASA astronauts fly to the moon for the first time since Apollo 17, which, incidentally, celebrated its 50-year anniversary of the lunar lander touchdown this week. Definitely some nice symmetry there between the last Apollo moon mission and the first Artemis mission. I would now like to give a massive thanks to all of the generous folk scenes scrolling on the left there. They're my Patreon supporters and channel members, and it's their generosity that allows me to continue making these videos. And hey, if you want to sign up, you'll not only see a name listed there, but you'll also get early access to videos and the occasional behind the scenes scoop as well. Thank you all so much for watching though, and I'll see you all next time. My exams are over this week, so hopefully I can do KSP content soon. Okay, bye.